I was recently reminded of the Klonoa games when playing Ridge Racer Type 4 because of the racetrack named Phantom Isle. And hey, fun fact, the director of the first Klonoa game, Hideo Yoshizawa, happened to be a project supervisor on Ridge Racer Type 4. But anyway, I've heard a lot of good things about the Klonoa games over the years, but I had never gotten around to actually trying them, and wow am I glad that I finally did. I enjoyed my experience with the first game so much that I wanted to see more of what the Klonoa series had to offer and decided to explore this niche franchise's history. So join me today as we look at all the games in the Klonoa series, yeah, even the volleyball spin-off game, this will be a retrospective on the entire Klonoa series. What better place to start than the game most people think of when you mention Klonoa, its debut on the PS1, Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle. In 1997, when Klonoa was released, platformers were having another big boom in popularity after the release of Mario 64 and Crash Bandicoot. The director of Klonoa, Hideo Yoshizawa, who at the time was most known for their work on the Ninja Gaiden series, recognized that the iron was hot for this kind of game. However, they felt with the boom of 3D gaming that many found the new style of movement difficult to control or confusing, so they set out to make a game that sort of bridged the gap. That's why Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle takes on the 2.5D style, where the game mostly controls in 2D, but there are 3D gameplay elements and camera movements that add the unique spice that sets Klonoa apart. Looking back on it now, this decision may be why the game failed to pick up the mainstream attention that many critics said it deserved. 3D was confusing and new, for sure, but that's kind of what made all these new games exciting. Yo, listen up! We will not live in a two-dimensional world! We won't go in one direction or see where we can set. We will walk through walls. We will take a look around us. We will not be confined. In fact, tons of crappy 3D games sold pretty well at the time just for pushing the technology. So Klonoa ended up being a little harder to build up hype for, because it decided to focus on iterating more so than innovating. In the end, it ended up not selling as well as Namco had probably hoped, at least not in North America, but the great game design and unique presentation made it really stick in the minds of diehard fans. And in retrospect, the 2.5D design has allowed the game to age much better than some of its early 3D counterparts. What also stuck in the minds of diehard fans though is the iconic Wahoo Klonoa says. This Wahoo got so popular that it actually reached number one on the Billboard charts. Okay, but for real enough jokes, let's look at the main thing Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle has really been remembered for, its incredible game mechanics and level designs. The most iconic mechanic in the game that basically defines the whole Klonoa series is the ability to pick up enemies and objects to either throw them, use them as a double jump, or use them as some sort of puzzle mechanic. This feature leads to the game having a more puzzle-oriented slant for a platforming game. The levels aren't usually focused on fast-paced precision platforming. They're more about taking your time to master unique mechanics or figuring out how certain puzzle elements will combine to allow you to progress to somewhere that seems inaccessible at first. All that being said, the controls for the platforming are super tight, and there are sections that will be purely a test of your platforming skills, and some of these were actually the highlight of the game for me. Sometimes these platforming sections were the worst part of the game though, because of the few times you're asked to land on super thin platforms. It all felt a little too hard and unfair fair compared to the rest of the game where the platforming is a little more lenient. These examples are few and far between though, and most of the game's challenge does really feel fair and it has a good difficulty curve. Now although the aesthetic of this game is clearly meant to appeal to younger kids, the challenge level here isn't dumbed down and the difficulty curve increases to get pretty challenging by the end of it. Although it's challenging, new mechanics and enemies are introduced at just the right rate and I never felt overwhelmed by something new or that I needed any kind of tutorial to explain new things, everything was taught through well-designed levels. And in my opinion, that's really the key to a puzzle platforming succeeding, the level design. You can have incredibly simple gameplay mechanics or movement and still make this genre work, as we've seen in games like Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker. The puzzle platformer genre is something that's actually had a boom in more modern indie games, with my favorite example being Even the Ocean. I like to think Klonoa had quite an influence on this genre because it was one of the first super polished examples of it and it really impressed me with how well designed it was for being such an innovative style of design at the time. Other than gameplay, a little bit of Klonoa's influence is just starting to be seen in very recently released games that are trying to bring back that surreal 32-bit low-poly style. 
I think the 2.5D games from the 32-bit era have aged the best and the colorful, trippy, dreamlike aesthetic in Klonoa has really stood the test of time. The decision to blend sprite animation with the 3D backgrounds is a big reason why that it has. The sprite work for Klonoa and most of the enemies is really fluid and expressive. It's super charming, but what's a little odd is that all the NPC characters are modeled in really strange looking 3D and then compressed into sprites. But it leads to the game having some unintentionally funny moments, like when your sidekick Hupao reveals their true form and they end up looking like a knockoff Rankin Bass claymation character or something. Speaking of Hupao, they have a big role in why the story is so fondly regarded by fans. Klonoa's story starts out seeming like your typical happy-go-lucky fantasy adventure where Hupao needs Klonoa's help to save the world of Phantom Isle from Gadius, a being known as the King of Darkness and Nightmares. Phantom Isle is a land of dreams, so Gadius is rejected by the people who fear their nightmarish powers. What's interesting is that Gadius' motivation to then destroy the world in the game comes more from a feeling of societal rejection than just being purely evil from the start of it, and it makes this villain more imposing and compelling than you might expect. Nightmares symbolize one's fears and insecurities, and if you attempt to seal those parts of yourself away instead of accepting them, you'll end up just feeding the negativity and having it come back to bite you later on. So this villain ends up having this surprising amount of thematic depth, and then the story actually goes to some darker places than you might expect too. There are two sad moments in particular that any Klonoa fan will cite as something that really stuck with them. If you want to avoid spoilers, skip to this timecode on screen now. So characters like Hu Pao and Klonoa's grandpa, who seem to be light-hearted comedic relief for most of the game, really shine in these two moments that I mentioned and bring some real emotional weight. I mean, the first example is that I would have never expected that Klonoa's grandpa would legitimately die. It was especially impactful as an emotional gut punch because of the fact that most of the game had a pretty cheerful tone. But after this point, the settings of the levels get darker and the bosses become more imposing, which nicely reflects Klonoa's emotional journey. At the end of this journey, Hu Pao then reveals to you that you actually weren't from this land of dreams, and that your memories of your life here are all made up. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. It's fiction. It's fiction. We made it up. We made this one up. It's a made up tale. It's a total fabrication. Even your grandpa isn't really your grandpa. It was all just these weird fake memories. You were just called here to help by Hu Pao, and now that your job is done, you're going to have to go back to your world and leave all these memories behind. This culminates in a really heart-wrenching goodbye that Klonoa refuses to accept, and the tearful goodbye as you're sent back to Klonoa's world will stick in the minds of anyone who plays this game for its surprisingly effective emotional weight. When Hu Pao tells you about the real nature of this world, it doesn't feel like the overused trope of, it was all a dream, either. No, it just feels like Klonoa is being pulled away from his friends and the world he thought was his home. This story balances these thematically rich and sad moments so well with its lighthearted sense of adventure in a way that's really hard to pull off. What does a great job of carrying you through those varying tones is the music. Now most of the music in the beginning of the game is really bright, cheerful, and catchy. But the highlights for me is when the soundtrack takes on a more ethereal and dreamy tone closer to the end of the game when things are getting darker. The range of musical styles and emotions is really impressive and really helps the game feel like the grand adventure it is. So, Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle really nails it on all fronts gameplay and presentation wise, and it's really a mystery to me as to why it never got the sales it deserved. Namco has made so many great games over the years, but they never really stood at the top of the industry in the console market. Maybe they lacked the marketing skills, or their focus on arcade experiences didn't allow them to push their home console releases as much. Who really knows? But what I do know is that everyone should definitely find a way to play Klonoa, and I can only cross my fingers and hope that the recent rumors of a modern remaster turn out to be true. Okay, so the first Klonoa didn't sell well, but it was a hit with critics and diehard fans. I mean, not every popular series sells well on their first installment. I mean, look at Mega Man 1. No! No! Oh yeah, wait, that's why. Well anyways, Namco thought Klonoa deserved another big push, and that's what gave us the second console game in the series, Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil vale in 2001. Rocket! 
There's a different director this time around, but it feels like they respected the vision from the first game and built from there. Klonoa 2 doesn't try to reinvent the wheel, and instead tries to iterate and introduce new mechanics on top of what already worked so well about the first game. A lot of new puzzle mechanics are added in this game, and the balance of puzzle to platformer challenges definitely starts to lean even more towards puzzles for this one. That's not a bad thing inherently, but for my taste, I kinda preferred the balance struck by the first game a little better. With the added challenge of these more complex puzzles, the creators thought it was a good idea to add some moments that allowed you to sit back and take a mental breather. So taking a note from Sonic Adventure, there are a lot of moments of non-gameplay spectacle, mostly done through these cannons you shoot out of that do a great job of showing off the really cool design of the world, and they often let you look back on how far you've come in the level in a really satisfying way. You also get this kind of effect during the new hoverboarding segments, which make for some really cool set pieces. There's something you'll notice when you're looking back on levels like this is that the levels are pretty huge. While this is definitely impressive and adds to the wonder of exploring them, sometimes I felt like it led to the pacing feeling a little off compared to the first. What helps the pacing though is that I found this game to be a little bit easier or more lenient, which makes sense because the first game might have been a little too challenging for kids near the end of it. I mean you have half the amount of health as you did in the first game and it still manages to be easier to not die in this one. That being said, the challenge curve does continue to rise and rise as the game does get pretty tough near the end just like the first one. For the most part though, it's really fair and fun, but there are these hoverboarding sections near the end that will really push your patience to its limit with their slippery, awkward controls. These moments are just bumps in the road though, and the progression difficulty and solid level design are top notch throughout nearly the entire game. Just like how the difficulty curve goes from kid friendly to challenging in the gameplay, the story in Klonoa 2 also has a similar sense of progression. It mirrors Klonoa 1 in a lot of ways, where it starts off very lighthearted and kid friendly, only to have some surprisingly deep emotional moments closer to the end of the game. What's different this time though is that the main cast of characters has been expanded and much more time is given to cutscenes. In this new adventure, Klonoa finds themselves traveling to the world of Lunatea and meeting Lolo and Popka. They ask you to help go around and collect these four elements that will save the world somehow. It's a pretty video gamey feeling excuse to just have a bunch of different worlds to go to, but what's nice is that all these worlds worlds are centered around different emotions, and that ties in nicely to the themes of the game. Along your journey to get these elements, you'll meet the main villains for most of the game, Leorina and Tad, who are trying to steal the elements from you. Leorina and Tad's edgy attitude and design really has that dark and cool but for kids kind of vibe like Shadow the Hedgehog. Where's that damn fourth chaos emerald? And it comes off as silly sometimes, and they don't really make for the most intimidating villains. What's odd about this is that these two actually aren't the true villains in the end, and the true villain of the story doesn't get any screen time until super late into the game. This kind of happened in the first game, but they at least appeared in the very beginning to set up for the end. It's a real shame though, because this real villain that's not introduced till the very end ends up being really interesting. That main villain, known as the King of Sorrow, explores very similar themes to Gadius in the first game. This land of emotions has societally rejected the King of Sorrow in a similar way to the land of dreams of Phantom Isle rejecting Gadius as the King of Nightmares in the first game. However, this time the thematic messaging of all that is much more clear because of Lunatia being themed around emotions. It's probably easier for a kid to understand that the King of Sorrow being rejected is a bad thing rather than a King of Darkness and Nightmares. So near the end of the game you get a lot of really cool thematic exploration of the character's emotions and what it means to embrace sorrow and all of that. Now Klonoa's role in this is kind of odd because for the most part they're just a sprightly and fun character who's just down to help anyone and doesn't have too much deep complexities to them. But what Klonoa does have is that they always are being accepting. And I think that's really cool because it drives home the themes of these games, whether you're accepting the darkness within yourself or the sorrow within yourself. And in the end of the day, Klonoa doesn't just save the day by beating a boss battle. It's the fact that Klonoa finally gave these villains their first experience of not being rejected for who they are that really saves the day. And I think that's a cool message. I felt like the themes and emotions explored here really resonated with me a good amount more than they did in Klonoa 1 when this game's story was at its best. I think a huge reason for that is that the music, in my opinion at least, is the best in the series. Once again, the music also mirrors the progression of Klonoa 1, with it going from a pretty kid-friendly, bright and cheerful tone in the beginning, to then getting more ethereal and spacey the further you go into the game.
However, this time near the end, it also gets very emotional too. The expanded possibilities and music afforded by the new hardware, the PS2, were used to the fullest and there's truly lush and beautiful tracks here. It's not just fidelity that helped elevate this OST though, the excellent use of repeated melodic theming really helps build the emotional weight of scenes later into the game. Furthermore, the huge variety of instruments really allows for so many more tones to be expressed. In particular, the strings and the spacey synth pads in this soundtrack are super well done and added emotional legitimacy to things that would be pretty goofy looking if the music wasn't actually there. So yeah, this was the peak of the music in the Klonoa games for me, and I would highly recommend checking out the OST even if you have no interest in playing the game. My overall thoughts though is that this was a great installment in the series, and it successfully made the jump to that next generation platform. However, it does lack some of the uniqueness and charm present in the first installment by going to a fully 3D art style, and I think the visuals end up feeling a little less iconic than the first one. And honestly, I think this could be why it kind of struggled to meet sales goals as well and could be why the series fizzled out a little bit after this. Because without a mega hit tentpole console game to prop up what would be the next handheld games and spin-off attempts, this era surrounding Klonoa 2 would become the swan song for the series, and Klonoa 2 would end up being the last new console installment that the series would ever see. So why don't we take a look at all those handheld games from that era though, because even though the main series failed to hit the big sales needed for longevity, all the handheld games made at the time still did well with the critics and are worth looking at today. Before we get to the GBA games that released around the time of Klonoa 2 though, we'll have to go back to 1999 for the first handheld game of the Klonoa series on a relatively obscure platform, the Wonderswan. <laughs> Yes, Klonoa Moonlight Museum released on a pretty underpowered, obscure, Japan-only handheld console, but what's surprising is that the gameplay is nearly up to par with the later GBA releases. The mechanics are pretty solid and they take the Klonoa formula to a fully 2D style for the first time. And I mean it's in black and white and it's a little more simplistic, but the game is still fun. Now the GBA games are quite a step up in pretty much every conceivable way, so I can't really recommend Moonlight Museum above any of those. I think this one's only really worth playing if you're a diehard fan and want to play absolutely every game in the series. Despite being a decent game, it stands out as the weakest entry in a long line of stellar platformers. A good example of what it does that sets it below is the music. Every other Klonoa game at least had great music even if you're not that into playing it at points. However, Moonlight Museum has a really weird and bland soundtrack. It's probably partly due to the limitations of the hardware because almost every song kind of sounds jarring and abrasive even when the melodies are okay sometimes. <laughs> Now the visuals accompanying that music are good though, and pretty striking for a black and white game. There's especially good pixel art and character designs and cutscenes. However, the story in those cutscenes is pretty flat, and just an excuse to have a large variety of levels without too much of a strong theme connecting them. It definitely has the most odd and confusing messaging of any of the games thematically, with the message at the end seeming to be, dreams make the moon glow, and artists shouldn't steal the moon because they think dreams are art. I have no idea what that could possibly be a metaphor for, but please let me know if you have some insights in the comments because I'm still scratching my head. The only thing making this one super unique and might compel you to play it above the other Klonoa games is that it has this gimmick where you sometimes turn the console on its side to play certain sections. This is totally a gimmick though, it doesn't really add much to the gameplay, it's just a little unique gimmick for the Wonderswan. I do have to thank this game for introducing me to the existence of the Wonderswan and the Wonderswan Color though. There's some really interesting games for these systems. For example, there's a game based on Arc the Lad 2's world, and that somehow captures the exact visual style for the PS1 game, which was really impressive. And there's a One Piece fighting game that has some really good looking animation. But that's enough about Japan only handheld consoles nobody knows about. Let's look at the Klonoa handheld games actually released in the West for the Game Boy Advance. It's kind of funny to me to think that a huge part of Klonoa's identity was the whole 2.5D thing, and now we've got these handheld games that completely take that away and somehow manage to keep that Klonoa charm. 
I think this is because what's most important for a game to feel like a true part of the Klonoa series, for me at least, is that the design of the levels and puzzles are stellar. In Klonoa Empire of Dreams for the GBA, they've adapted the design philosophy of the console Klonoa games perfectly for handheld, and this one is a big step up from the one on the Wonderswan. Now for one thing, because it's handheld, the screen is so much smaller, so they smartly focused on adding more interesting puzzle elements to play with in a more densely packed area. This leads to strictly platforming challenges not being so prevalent, which makes sense, but at the same time it's kind of a shame because of how tight the controls are. The great platforming controls do get the brief time to shine during the auto-scroller levels though, however these are auto-scroller levels, so yeah, for me these are never as fun as platforming with more freedom. I think a good part of what makes the platforming feel so tight like this is the incredible animations and artwork. The sprite work is super charming throughout the whole game and there's some awesome character designs. Although the backgrounds are a bit kind of lacking when compared to the vibrant creativity of the settings from the console games. It's clear the focus of this game was really on refining the gameplay and designing good puzzles, so some aspects fell by the wayside. Speaking of, another aspect that was kinda overlooked was the story. Kinda like Moonlight Museum, the story's thematic messaging is kinda muddled and weird. The basic plot is that the emperor of the land isn't allowing anyone to dream because they suffer with insomnia and if they can't dream then no one else can, I guess? Not letting people dream causes these people to turn into these weird monsters though, and so Klonoa has to go out and turn these people back to normal by fighting them as boss fights, which, side note, are really fun and creative boss fights that stack up well next to the good bosses in the console games. So yeah, anyways, this story is just kind of an excuse to have a dream-related theme that takes you to a variety of areas, not really much of an actual plot. But what makes it really weird is when the thematic message at the end of the game tries to act like it's an important life lesson. Basically, the Emperor learns in the end that you have to let people you rule dream? Which, um, I guess it's relatable to anyone who's got insomnia and forced an entire kingdom of people to stay awake with them, but for people who haven't done that, this might not have the emotional weight you're used to from the console Klonoa games. One thing they definitely did get right and stands up in quality to the console entries is the music. Now, because it's on a handheld console, the songs are a bit shorter and therefore a little bit repetitive, but I can totally overlook that because of the quality of the soundtrack across the board. They somehow managed to have a lot of variety in the instrumentation, even within the limitations of the GBA, and they really translated the sound that Door to Phantom Isle had to the GBA really well. Honestly, even though I've had some gripes with parts of the game, it was overall an incredible experience because of the gameplay, music, and the visuals were all top notch, and this game is probably in my top 5 or so GBA games. So with such a high bar set by the first GBA game, how did the second one released in 2002 turn out? Well, if you grew up outside Japan, you wouldn't have the chance to figure that out until 2005, which by that time, the Nintendo DS had already released, so of course this game didn't have much success in the West. This is really a shame though, because Klonoa 2 Dream Champ Tournament is another incredible entry to the series. By the way, I think it's really funny that this is the second Klonoa 2 in the series. It's like Klonoa 2... 2? But confusing titles aside, dang the presentation in this game is top notch. I thought Empire of Dreams had some great visuals for the GBA, but Dream Champ Tournament blew these out of the water. There is so much more personality, variety, and style now, especially in the backgrounds and environments. They're so colorful and charming. My favorite part by far though is that the main enemy in the series, known as Moose, have a different design for each world you visit. It's so dang cute, and as someone who loves cool little cute unnecessary touches in games, this bit really got me. It's not just the visual design that's good here though. The gameplay is absolutely incredibly designed once again, and they've been able to greatly expand the variety of puzzle mechanics and enemy types by bringing in elements from Lunatea's Veil. Vale. Because these handheld games are much more focused on having creative puzzles, this works super well and keeps the game fresh from start to finish. Other than any new puzzling mechanics, the gameplay is pretty much the same as Empire of Dreams, but with a little more polish. So with all that being said, it seems like the clear best Klonoa on the GBA, right? Eh? Well, uh, unfortunately, there are a few elements that make recommending Dream Champ Tournament over Empire of Dreams a little iffy. The biggest thing holding back Dream Champ Tournament is that the boss battles are absolutely awful. They all are designed as these really frustrating race segments. And these are bad enough, but it doesn't help that they have the worst song ever playing for each one, which definitely adds to the frustration. 
Oh my god, turn that off. Why is this in this game? No, no, seriously, turn it off, turn it off! As for other negative elements, near the end of the game, there are a few absolutely atrocious water levels that control terribly, so I'd say if you value a consistently solid experience, go with Empire of Dreams. But if you're okay with some bumps in the road, go with Dream Champ Tournament because the main levels that serve as the core of the game are better designed and it's a lot more charming because of the improved graphics. Also adding to that charm is the music. I have no idea how they crammed these incredible songs into the GBA, but wow, they really pushed the hardware and made some really full sounding tracks for a handheld device. They often use a similar bass instrument to songs from the Minish Cap, and it really fills out the space that's often lacking in GBA soundtracks. The music here leans more towards the atmosphere of Lunatea's Veil, vale, with a lot of interesting pad synths and a bit faster beats, but it really carves out its own unique style to be honest. What doesn't have much of a unique style though is this story. Once again, it's just another random excuse for an adventure. This time it's some robot dude who's holding a tournament where you're basically pretending like you're competing against other contestants when you're playing the levels. At least the tournament aspect allows for a rivalry kind of storyline with the character Guns, and it serves as an excuse to bring back characters from all the other Klonoa games for cameos. Thankfully this time they didn't try to shoehorn in a bad attempt at a weird thematic message this time, so it just plays out as a pretty standard feeling adventure with a big villain to battle at the end and leaves you feeling satisfied instead of confused. Now what might leave some of you Klonoa fans confused is the weird spin-off games in the series. In an attempt to build up the Klonoa brand to a more flagship status, Namco tried to dip their toes into having Klonoa themed takes on other genres besides platformers. The first one we're going to look at is Klonoa Heroes Densetsu no Star Metal, which is a Japan-only action RPG for the GBA. Thankfully, there's a fan-made English patch, and it's pretty well done. I was pretty intrigued by the idea of a Klonoa RPG because the character designs and settings and worlds were always really interesting. There was a lot of potential here to make something that felt like a grand adventure. Unfortunately though, Densetsu no Star Metal turned out to be painfully mediocre. It's a really simple action RPG that plays like a really poor dungeon crawler and fails to have any real depth to its combat. It can be challenging at times, mostly just during some bosses who have way too much health. When you combine that with the most boring level design I've ever seen, uninteresting enemies who are total damage sponges, and the occasional horrendous water level, none of the classic Klonoa charm really comes through in the gameplay department. Although it does have some of that Klonoa charm in its presentation and story cutscenes. You get to see an alternate universe style story which allows for characters from all over the series to appear. That being said, the story lacks any intrigue or exciting drama that usually makes RPG stories work, especially in the first hours of the game. It takes way too many hours for the main plot of the game to get rolling, and by the time you reach it, you'll really be craving something interesting. However, the plot turns out to be about the villains trying to enact some doomsday thing, and it just lacks any kind of real interesting mystery to keep you playing. The themes mostly deal with what it means to be a hero, and ends up really only making the statement that heroes help people and never give up, which again is just super generic. This bland plot would be more acceptable if it was at least a super wacky adventure, but despite the characters personalities being really entertaining and funny, it's hard to enjoy those positive aspects because what's happening between those characters is so uninteresting and generic. One saving grace is that the music is some of the best in the whole series in my opinion, so do check out the OST even if you don't end up playing the game. So I think it's clear that Klonoa was trying to do a similar thing to Mario by spinning off into an RPG, so it makes sense that they'd also try and do the other kind of Mario spin-off, that being sports video games. And that's how we ended up with Klonoa Beach Volleyball for the PS1. Funnily enough, this game came out after the PS2 game and the handheld games, but still released on the PS1. It's kinda odd to see a game get a next generation release, then to have a spin-off on a previous generation console. That being said though, it was really fun to see all these characters done in a really charming PS1 low-poly style. 
And you know what? This game is just chock full of charm like that. The stages, the music, the characters, and the animations are all brimming with that vibrant and colorful Klonoa style. <laughs> This game is pretty difficult though. Honestly, I struggled really hard in anything past the third stage of the main story mode. This difficulty level is kind of a shame though because it controls so well and has a lot of potential to be great. However, it feels like the computer just seems to read your mind and always knows where to be to return your shot. And then returning their shots is often just way too unreactable. I think the mechanics would be really fun in a multiplayer match though, and thankfully you can play this one with up to four players if you want. This is actually the only Klonoa game with any kind of multiplayer multiplayer funny enough. It's a shame though because the multiplayer venture here is pretty good and I wish we got the chance to see Klonoa spin off into more fun side games, but after 2002 we didn't get to see any new Klonoa games for 6 years. Although even then it wouldn't really be a new game. In 2008, after the merger of Namco and Bandai, the higher-ups at the company thought it was time to try and give Klonoa one last push. So to test the waters, they thought it best to create a remake of Door to Phantom Isle, which makes sense because that game was the height of popularity for the series. Fans were really excited because they brought back the original director of Door to Phantom Isle, Hideo Yoshizawa, in a producer role this time. Other key staff who worked on the first game were also brought back, so it looked like all the right elements were coming together for this remake. And honestly, what can I say? They did a really good job. This is a pretty faithful remake and the graphical overhaul looks pretty good for what it is. In my opinion, I think the original PS1 style is so much cooler and unique, but I could definitely see people in 2008 wanting this kind of graphical update when retro graphical styles weren't as fondly looked back upon as they are now. So even though they changed the graphics quite a bit, thankfully the gameplay and level design is pretty much untouched and plays just as well as the original. There are slight tweaks to the mechanics, the most notable being the added range to your wind bullet which lessens some of the frustration when trying to pick up enemies while not changing the actual challenge level of most of the game. What does change the challenge level though is that you can now take 10 hits instead of 6, which is a little odd because 6 hits is already pretty high for a game like this. But I had no complaints for this change really. Most of my deaths in both versions of the game were from falling into ledges and not from getting hit, so it didn't really change the game at all for me. Other than changes to what was already there, this remake also added a little extra content. All the levels can now be played in reverse once you beat the game to add a little bit of variety for a repeat playthrough. They also added secret challenge rooms to this mode that are reminiscent of Donkey Kong Country's secret challenge rooms, eh, but these aren't the most interesting, which is kind of a shame because technically this is the only real new content that's not just a remix or a new mode to play old content. There are other additions like time attack mode for the boss battles and a cutscene viewer mode, but these don't add too much to the overall package. They're just bonuses on top of an already great game. And that pretty much sums up this remake as a whole, a new coat of paint on top of an excellent game with a tiny bit of bonus content sprinkled on top. The game was pretty well received by critics and fans, but it didn't really amaze anyone. Due to the game not being as innovative as it was in 1997 and not adding too much new content, this wasn't the big hit that the Klonoa brand needed to reignite. The game ended up selling really poorly and pretty much put the nail in the coffin for the series for the time being. Now there have been a couple attempts to spark interest in the series since then like the webcomic that ran from 2012 to 2014 or the development on a Klonoa film in 2017 that was eventually cancelled in 2019. But nothing big has really been done with the IP in 13 years. Klonoa still has a diehard fanbase that would love to see some sort of a revival, but I don't think we'll ever really see it because the high bar for quality of the Klonoa games has never been reflected in their consistently low sales. Although the fanbase for this niche franchise has continued to grow due to the word of mouth over the years and the advent of retro gaming YouTube videos, it's hard to quantify that interest into potential sales numbers. So this underappreciated series will probably stay just discussed among retro gaming enthusiasts and that's really a shame because this series is home to some of the best puzzle platformers ever. The design is so tight across the whole series that I never once had to look up a solution to a puzzle in any of the games. And I'm someone who always gets stuck at least a few times in any Zelda game. Smooth and satisfying level design is super important to me. So because of the incredible level design across the entire series, I've really found some of my new favorite games of all time. There's even a lot of content I didn't even touch because I'm not that into 100%ing games, but I was still always left satisfied by the difficulty curves of the main content and it's really nice that they put in all that extra stuff for really diehard fans. 
Other than just gameplay though, the visual presentation has stood the test of time for every entry in the series basically. The music was always great, and the stories were sometimes really touching and surprisingly deep, but even when they weren't, they at least had a lot of personality. It's hard to find a series of games as consistently good as Klonoa across so many titles and it makes you wonder how much they've influenced modern platformers today, especially with the boom of puzzle platformers in particular within indie games, as well as the trend to take inspiration from neglected classic games. It kind of gives you the hope that maybe there will be a spiritual successor to Klonoa one day. Hopefully we see that in the future, but for now that's all I've got to say about Klonoa. Thanks so much for watching and let me know your thoughts on the series in the comments and subscribe if you want to see more game reviews and retrospectives. Also please let me know if you know of any games that play similarly to Klonoa 2 because after enjoying these so much, it's been hard to find any other games that scratch that itch. Anyways, thanks again for watching and I hope you have a great day. Bonus stage. Okay, I found this while doing research for this video and I just had to share it. Muscle March is the last game the director of Klonoa did and it's absolutely bonkers. It was a WiiWare game released in 2009 and it's basically an endless runner type of game with a really odd bodybuilding theme to it. Its visuals are totally off the wall and the game is kind of good for what it is, but the real highlight is the music. There are some really incredible songs on its OST and they were made by one of the people who made a lot of the songs for Katamari Damacy. You can hear that style reflected here and the way it blends chiptune, techno, and jazzy funk. I can't fully recommend you check out this game because it's pretty simple and repetitive, but definitely check out the music. Anyways, now that the video is really over, go play some Klonoa and have a nice day.